can you talk us through your investment process? So we, we build a number of portfolios. Um, we actually have seven different strategies. We have um, moderate risk, which is analogous to a 50-50 bond equity. We have aggressive risk, which would be analogous to a 70 equity, 30 bond. And we have 100% equity. And across all of those portfolios, we, we, the equity is consistent. We then also do it across three base currencies, so dollar, euro, pound. So that's how we get to the seven. 100% equity is just reported in a different base currency dollar euro pound but it's the same portfolio and then for the dollar euro and pound bond components of each of those respective portfolios we match the investment grade bonds of those portfolios to the base currency but for the equities they're the same across the, the entire spectrum let me start with a little bit with bonds for the moderate and aggressive portfolios where we have bonds really what we're looking at and considering in the construction thereof are two things we consider credit risk and we consider duration so you know, how much credit risk are we willing to take? At the core of our investment grade component, we really will own, for example, treasuries, bunds, or gilts across those different currencies. And then we'll also own investment grade corporates um, across the different currency classes as well. And then we make a decision how much high yield would we like to include or how much emerging market bonds, either dollar emerging market or, or, dom or domestic currency emerging markets, so local currency bonds. And depending on the time in the cycle, we might own more credit risk, so we might own more investment grade corporates versus the governments, or we might own more high yield or more EM versus investment grade. And so that's really what we're thinking about within the credit spectrum. And you consider a number of things in, in doing so, credit spreads, the tightening of spreads, monetary policy, etc. The other thing we're doing is we're considering how much duration we want to take. So what is the maturity of these bonds? Duration is a, is a measure for interest rate risk, which I could elaborate on, but essentially we're considering do we want to own short dated bonds or a bit longer dated bonds and that's often an analysis relating to monetary policy in that particular country with respect to the equities where we differ from a lot of the traditional managers who build multi-asset portfolios is if you look at indices like the MSCI world and the FTSE world they are typically 60 percent Americas and that's a large a large reason for that is because the market capitalization of the US is huge and there are lots of companies that list in the US and that index construction is very robust. But when one looks at the world in a slightly different light, so you consider the world by global GDP weights, you consider the world by global growth rates, GDP growth rates, you consider the world by global population weights, you consider the world by IPO activity, you consider the world by capital being raised in a particular region or country. And you look at all these factors, there's a clear shift to Asia, and particularly China. And so, we don't think if one is invest or a lot of our clients and, and the clients with whom we deal generally have a 5, 10, 15, 20 year plus view, a long term view, we can't say with certainty how the world will look in 10 or 20 years. And so at the core of our process, we've deviated from the 60% Americas. We start our equity weighting roughly a third, a third, a third between Americas, EMEA and Asia Pacific. So that's really at our strategic allocation. There's a clear distinction from a lot of the major indices in, in global, global equity indices. Then what we're doing is, is a tactical process, as I, as I mentioned before, where we are trying to look for opportunities the world presents us in sectors or countries in the equity space. So in emerging markets, it's very difficult to own a sector ETF. There, for example, if you wanted to own the South Africa telco sector, there isn't a South African telco ETF, but there is a South African market ETF on the top 40, for example. So, you can't always express the view on a sector in EM, but you can generally express the view on the country. So in emerging markets, it's typically country only. When you delve into the developed world, you know, if it's the S&P 500, for example, or it's the Russell 1000, the Russell 2000, it's the Stock 600, or it's the FTSE 100, or it's the Nikkei, or it's the CSI 300 in China, there are all these different major indices. Many of them, and most of the developed market countries, have sector ETFs as well. So you can express a view on healthcare, on financial services, on consumer staples, consumer discretionary, utilities, etc. And so we are considering that all the time, looking at sectors and countries in the developed market, and then looking at countries in EM. And what drives our, our process in terms of do we, do we want to do something or make a change to the portfolio, is we obviously follow news every day obsessively, everyone in the team reads financial press and the, and the like. We also get lots of research from, from research from many of the banks with whom we work. 
We also do a lot of our own research. We have lots of screens and internal controls we've built, lots of alerts we've built to, to remind us or, or alert us to things that change in, in markets. And if there's a big event, geopolitically, macroeconomically, whatever, or something screens is very cheap, and it, be and it becomes cheap because of this event, it opens our eyes and we say, okay, let's do some homework. So we'll source and gather as much information we can from everyone we work with to get information on that particular sector or country. And then we do our own research. And we'll often debate over the course of two to four weeks whether we actually express the view because we want to be thorough in our, our working. And at the core of that process is valuation. We prefer to own things when they're cheap. We're not going to be chasing a theme like marijuana deregulation and because the marijuana companies trade at ridiculous multiples of earnings. And we can't get our head around paying that much for those, those companies or that ETF that tracks marijuana. So we generally, at the core of our process, is valuation. And it's often driven by a geopolitical or, or macroeconomic or, or other catalyst that opens our eyes to do the homework. The other important part of our process is, because we're not sitting in a bank or sitting in a brokerage or tied to any bank or brokerage, we're not incentivized to trade often. We don't earn a commission at all. We have one simple fee, 0.3%. So we're not incentivized to buy Anglo and sell Billiton or sell healthcare and buy its consumer staples in the ETF example because we don't earn a commission. We are solely trying to add skill to the process. So we typically only have between four to eight ideas per annum where we might shift a portfolio. And the other important part of that process is we also could be wrong and we have to be humble about that. We're not always going to be right on our idea. We might buy something that's fallen 25% and looks cheap, and then it ends up falling 50% and we entered at the wrong point. So we have to be humble about the fact that we could be wrong, and therefore we size our tilts appropriately. Typically, all our tilts are between 3 to 6% of a portfolio. And we, you know, as I mentioned, sort of 4 to 8 ideas at any given moment in time. So really at the core of our investment process is a, a very strong discipline for researching thoroughly, but valuation is at the core of that and a preference for buying things which have become cheap, not things which are in vogue at the particular moment in time.